Welcome to Online Worship. My name is Amanda Bennett, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, an open and affirming, peace-loving congregation. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. The first is that Lenten Connect groups begin this month. Lenten Connect groups offer a relaxed way to connect with people in our church community around various shared interests. You could play bocce ball with Bob in the park, or you could sort through church pictures with Joan. To see all of the incredible groups, visit our website and select the Connect drop-down menu from the home page, and then you can select on Lenten Connect group page uh, to sign up. The deadline for signups is February 23rd, so please sign up today. Last week, our interim pastor, Carol Wise, shared news of an upcoming change in our online worship offering, and I'd like to reiterate that announcement again for you today. After several months of careful deliberation and consideration of our congregation's resources, its priorities, and commitment to privacy and copyright laws, our church board has decided to move to an audio-only broadcast of the Sunday morning sermon beginning on March 5th. This audio offering will continue to be shared on our YouTube channel and will be available at 5 p.m. on Sundays. We ask for your understanding as we make this shift and continue to work at becoming a faithful and beloved church community. And now, may we ground ourselves in love, light, and authenticity as we worship this day. i uh -huh. 
Just need a moment to soak that in. Beautiful rendition of Psalm 23. A psalm of comfort and security. Not all of the psalms have that flavor, as you heard in the children's story today. Uh, here is Psalm 55, more of a psalm of distress. I'll try to, to add a little flavor so that you have the idea. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked. They bring me down suffering and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me, fear and trembling beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and the storm. Oh, Lord, confuse the wicked. Confound their words, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide, but it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship. In the house of God, we walked about among the worshipers, Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead, for evil finds lodging among them. As for me, I call upon God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and God hears my voice. The Almighty rescues me unharmed from the battle against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, the Lord will hear them and humble because they have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn sore. Cast your cares on the Lord, and God will sustain you. Elohim will never let the righteous be shaken. 
You, O oh God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their lives. But as for me, I trust in God. Have you ever participated in community prayer that didn't land well on your ears? Maybe you've encountered prayer in a group setting and the prayer itself didn't seem quite truthful. Gathered around the dinner table, I have often heard prayers that thanked God for the health of my family, when in reality, loved ones sitting at the table struggled with severe chronic illness. Though these prayers were well-intentioned, as a child, they felt strange to me. I didn't understand the concept behind authentic prayer, and some of my own prayer life can be characterized by an urge to pray butterflies and rainbows, only the good things in life, while leaving out the pains, the storms, and the clouds. Yet the Psalms demonstrate another way to pray, authentically and truthfully. Praise, complaint, thanksgiving, lament. The Psalms poetically and vulnerably express the wide array of our human lived experience. It would seem that the psalmist does not hold back, or Tom, <laughs> or as theologian Walter Brueggemann writes, the Psalms contain an abrasive truth-telling, a willingness to question God, friends, community, to name pain, oppression, and greed. Take Psalm 55, which you just heard. This truth-telling psalmist pours her heart out, complaining of the anguish she has experienced, the utter abuse. She boldly recounts the trouble she has endured at the hands of not just anyone, but at the hands of friends. Her pain is so great that she desires to disassociate, to turn into a bird and fly away, fly somewhere safe. She even goes as far as to pray for death to come upon these so-called friends who have hurt her beyond comprehension. She names oppression and fraud which exist in her society. She speaks abrasive truth in prayer to God and in her community. See, Old Testament scholar Gerald T. Shepherd suggests that there is power in the truth-telling found in the Psalms. He proposes that the Psalms may be viewed as a form of public protest. His work identifies that the enemies often named in the Psalms are the ruling elite who inflict pain and continue cycles of oppression in the Israelite society. He also points out that the Psalms were likely prayed out loud in spoken word or song in communal spaces where these enemies would be present, their actions exposed amongst the people. The psalmist in our scripture today calls out her friend who has injured her. Psalm 94 identifies enemies who bring violence to widows, the displaced, and abandoned children. I wonder if such truth-telling would have any lasting consequences. Would some sort of accountability or action come from these spoken laments? As the quote in our bulletin reads, the easiest way to solve a problem is to deny it exists. The Psalms refuse to deny reality, refuse to deny emotions and pain. They refuse to deny the abuse, oppression, the broken public systems which existed in the ancient world and continue to exist in our world today. Instead of denial, the Psalter gives voice to these truths aloud and in community. The psalmist's refusal to deny the truth leads me to think about the larger church, often called the universal church. It's all of us little C churches put together. I can't help but think of the ways in which the church has repeatedly denied abuse and oppression which reside in our society, in our churches, and in ourselves. 
in the words of Taylor Swift and her song, Anti-Hero. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. When the wider church denies the abuse of its leaders, denies the fact that toxic theology dehumanizes and traumatizes, denies its part in the perpetuation of oppression, then indeed it is part of the problem. In high school, I participated in a yearly day of prayer. It was called See You at the Pole. My body recoils a little bit when I name that out loud um, in my participation in this day. See You at the Pole was, and still is, identified as a holy day where Christian students, teachers, community leaders, and pastors would gather at the flagpole of high schools around the United States. This would be a ritual act of prayer allowed in our community. It often played out this way. A pastor would come early with dozens of donuts. <laughs> the most devout students, or the students who like donuts the most, <laughs> would join him early at 6.30 in the morning, and the, the pastor was always a hymn. <laughs> We would feast on jelly-filled donuts until go time. At 7 a.m., we would reluctantly put our donuts aside and flock toward the flagpole, joining hands to make a giant circle, centering our bodies around the flag for a time of prayer. Silence filled the air until a pastor began to pray aloud, and then a sort of popcorn prayer ensued as students, teachers, and other pastors would pray aloud with silence filling the spaces between each voice. As I reflect on this time of prayer, I remember prayers that pled for God to transform our public high school into a Christian school and for our nation to turn back into a Christian nation, for all hearts to turn towards Jesus. I'm sure there was a student or two who uh, shed some tears and whimpered as we centered our hearts and bodies around the flag of the United States. What I don't remember is any truth telling. No one named the horror of Columbine or voiced any anger toward gu gun culture in the United States. No one prayed for the prevalent abuse of women in our society. We didn't name the horrors enacted by white supremacy. I don't recall any complaint about the ruling elite and oppression that consumerism instills. Truth-telling laments had no home among that flagpole. Womanist scholar and ethicist Emily M. Towns describes the importance of truth-telling laments in this way. Laments mark the beginning of the healing process when we open ourselves up to look at the situations we find ourselves in and our own complicity in them, as well as the ways in which we are victimized by them. We name the horrors, bankrupt immigration policies, race baiting, white supremacy, biased drug policies, mass incarceration, troubled educational systems and policies, forms of violence, human trafficking, and more. By naming these things, we can address them rather than simply survive them. She goes on to say, naming these horrors in an unrestrained lament helps mold us into a people who respond with an emphatic no to the ways our nation and our communities of faith are turned into graven images of hatred and despair. I can't travel back in time and add truth-telling to my dinner time prayers, or to those popcorn prayers at see you at the pole, or maybe not even attend see you at the pole. What I can do is this. I can acknowledge the harsh truths of today. My family dinner table can be a place where we authentically pray, naming our personal and societal truths. In community prayer, I can acknowledge the brokenness and dysfunction which exists in the systems of today, as well as within myself. Friends, the truth we name in prayer and lament, whether privately in our spirits or publicly in corporate worship, holds significance. 
Inviting honesty into prayer marks the beginning of individual and corporate healing. And first naming the truth within us and around us, only then can we begin the hard work of creating a better future for all. Amen. Thank you.